Good afternoon to those of you here in Washington, D.C., in Venable's Law Offices, and good afternoon to those of you on the telephone, or good morning to those of you on the West Coast. Uh, we have a uh, modest-sized group here in D.C. in uh, mid-August, uh, which we're very pleased to, uh, to see, and we have uh, actually an incredibly large group of uh, a couple hundred people on the telephone, which we're uh, extremely encouraged to see. Thank you very much for uh, participating. Uh, putting on programs in the, in the dead of August in D.C. is uh, never usually a recipe for a successful attendance, but uh, at least on the telephone, uh, we did extremely well today, so we're, we're, we're very pleased about that. Thank you for joining us, and I think you'll be pleased that you did. Uh, my name is Jeff Tenenbaum. Uh, I'm the chair of the nonprofit organization's practice here at the Venable Law Firm. Um, I, I see a lot of familiar faces here, and see a lot of familiar faces registered on the um, on the webinar component of, of today's program. Uh, as many of you know, this is part of a, uh, a monthly series that we've been doing now for uh, for probably about six months, and plan to continue doing on a wide variety of nonprofit legal issues. Uh, we're doing these programs uh, at least once a month. Actually, in October, we'll be doing two programs uh, from 12 to 2 p.m. For, uh, Eastern Time. For those of you who are in the D.C. area, feel free to join us for these programs for, for lunch uh, on the house, so to speak, from 12 to 12.30. And then we do the program both in person and on the uh, telephone and webinar from 12.30 to 2 p.m. Eastern Time. Uh, they're always free, and they're always on uh, uh, topics that we think are, are kind of hot. Uh, timely topics in the nonprofit uh, and association worlds, and uh, we plan to continue these uh, for, for quite some time. I want to thank uh, our special co-sponsor today, Association Trends, uh, which is kind enough to, uh, to co-sponsor our program with us today. The uh, topic of today's program is nonprofit executive compensation, avoiding the treacherous tax and governance pitfalls. Um, it's a very, very important topic, a very timely topic, certainly a very hot topic. Uh, we have two uh, speakers here today. We were supposed to have three speakers here today. Uh, unfortunately, one of our speakers, Pete Smith, uh, was unavoidably delayed. His flight was canceled yesterday coming back from Paris. He's actually in the air flying back now, but was unable to join us and, and sends his regrets. Uh, so my colleague Matt Journey to my immediate right is going to be playing the role of Pete Smith today, and we'll be covering uh, Pete's PowerPoint presentation to the greatest extent that, that Matt can. Uh, Matt is a colleague of mine in our nonprofit practice. Uh, he is our nonprofit tax guru, uh, a specialist in every sense of the word, and has worked with us on uh, handling at least 100 different IRS audits and appeals of tax-exempt organizations in the last few years or so. Uh, and works with hundreds of our nonprofit clients each year, each year on uh, nonprofit uh, tax compliance and, uh, and controversy issues. And uh, Matt's going to be a great resource here today because he's dealt with so many of these executive comp issues uh, firsthand on the front lines in IRS audits and appeals and even in court cases now. Um, and I think you'll have a lot to learn from Matt today. Uh, to my far right is Travis Patton. Travis is a partner in PricewaterhouseCoopers National Tax Services Office and is a member of uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers Exempt Organization Tax Services Practice. Uh, for 13 years, Travis has provided tax services to tax exempt organizations with a focus on higher, educa higher education and health care. Uh, Travis also brings a great perspective here to, uh, to today's program uh, and has dealt also with many of these issues uh, in the context of IRS audits uh, and it's really going to bring a very interesting perspective to today's program. A uh, few um, housekeeping items in terms of resources you have in front of you, for those of you here in the room and for those of you on the, on the webinar, it should have been emailed to you, um, a, a PDF file containing the PowerPoint presentations for today's program along with a few um, additional resources from, from Pete and Travis. Um, I neglected to include a, a couple timely uh, and relevant articles of ours, one on the uh, IRS interim report, interim report on college and university uh, tax compliance, which is a subject that Matt's going to be covering here today, and another one on the IRS tax-exempt audit process. You can find both of those articles as well as all of our nonprofit um, legal articles and PowerPoint presentations at the, uh, the usual link that I give out, www.venable.com slash nonprofits slash publications. Venable.com slash nonprofits slash publications. We have about 600 resources there searchable by topic area. And also, if you're interested in upcoming seminars like this and other events that we're doing both here at Venable and elsewhere, we have a link where you can find those at venable.com slash nonprofits slash events. And if you want to be added to our, our mailing list for uh, future event announcements, just let us know. Um, as always, for these monthly uh, seminars and webinars, we are recording this session, um, and a, a uh, link to the, uh, to the recording and the PowerPoints will be sent out to everyone 
to, tomorrow, and feel free to share that with your colleagues and others who, have may, who may not have been able to, uh, to, to join us here today. Finally, as far as questions go, uh, for those of you in the room, feel free to interrupt us at any time with, with questions throughout the program. For those of you on the telephone uh, and on the webinar, um, many of you are, are very good at using the chat feature on the webinar component. Feel free to, to, uh, to send me questions. I'll be monitoring that with a laptop at the front of the room, and I will interrupt our speakers throughout with, with questions uh, as, they, as they come up and are, and are timely and relevant to what the speakers are talking about, and then we'll pose the rest of them uh, at the end. And also at the end, if we have additional questions, we'll open up the, uh, the microphones for, uh, for, for audio questions as well. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague Matt Journey to get us started. Matt? Sorry, bear with us with that technical difficulty with the uh, PowerPoint. Sure enough, when you go and you test it, you make everything w working well, and then it turns out to not work in the end. Well, Matt, why don't you go ahead and uh, yeah, Matt, why don't you go ahead and get get started, and uh, and we'll figure out the PowerPoint. Just you can sit down there. Just uh, everyone has a. It'll have to change up here. Yeah. Well, we figure out the uh, the PowerPoint presentation on the webinar. Just follow along in the uh, in the handout books for those of you. I got it. Okay. There we go. <laughs> Thank you for your patience. Okay. Sorry about that. Uh, the purpose of this presentation is really to explain the significance of executive compensation. Uh, the, the reason I wanted or we wanted to have uh, an individual from an accounting firm, an individual from Venable and a compensation consultant was because we also wanted to show the scope of the professional resources available. We um, wanted to explain the rules regarding executive compensation and other transactions with uh, insiders and uh, the consequences of those um, organizations as well as how organizations can protect themselves. Um, starting out with the significance of executive compensation, uh, there are really two ways in which uh, executive compensation is extremely significant and important for exempt organizations. First of all, uh, with respect to the organization itself, providing excessive compensation to executives can be grounds for revocation. So it's important for an organization in order to maintain its tax exempt status to only provide reasonable compensation. But then also, because of the unique way uh, exempt organizations are treated, it's important for executives of uh, uh, exempt organizations to receive fair compensation because um, executives, the compensation paid to executives at exempt organizations is reported uh, to the world. Uh, 990s are available online. Um, any executive that's participating in this, uh, this uh, uh, seminar, if they were to email me their name, the organization they worked for, I could email them back in 10 minutes and say, well, you made this much in calendar year 2009 or 2010, depending on when it was last reported. Um, also, with respect to that, you're also indicating how much, uh, how many hours a week you work on an average and uh, the title. So, uh, from a perception standpoint, both inside the organization and outside the organization, there are concerns with the executive compensation. Uh, first, um, employees of your organization may very well look up the compensation of the executives of the organization. And from a morale standpoint, uh, that's something that's very important to understand. If uh, you're an executive who may work a lot at home but isn't necessarily in the office a lot, uh, an employee who is actually in the office at 8 or 9 every morning and leaves at, at 6 or 7 every night will look at that and say, well, why are they making seven times as much as I do? I'm in the office so much more. And, and that's, a, that's a big morale issue. Uh, in addition to that, there's also um, for C3s that rely on, on contributions from donors. Uh, donors may look at this and look at the compensation and say, wait a second, your 990 says you work 35 hours a week and you're getting paid $400,000 a year. Why should I part with my money and give to your organization when 
uh, I don't think you're working hard enough for the, the salaries you're paying your executives. Um, and there are all ways to deal with this, but it's important from both a, a legal and compliance standpoint and from a morale standpoint and a, the public relations standpoint to understand that this information is available and this information is used by individuals to make decisions. This is especially important now uh, as we're sort of coming in the aftermath of uh, the recent economic downturn where executive compensation was considered to be a very important part of everything that was happening and uh, the bonuses and extravagant uh, benefits provided to executives, albeit in the taxable uh, realm, were all things that were heavily scrutinized and heavily criticized. That scrutiny and criticism has uh, sort of seeped over into the nonprofit world where there's a significant amount of information available. And um, the, every year, every few months, you will see in the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal and some other publication a list of top executive salaries. And it's never, I've never seen a list like that done in a way that says, hey, look at how great they're doing for so little money. It's always the opposite where they're saying, uh, it seems to be taking the position that why are we paying presidents of universities this exorbitant sum of money? Why are we paying uh, uh, these charities this amount of money? It, it seems like there'd be other people willing to take it for, do the job for far less. So this is something that's very important for organizations to understand and to uh, uh, sort of direct them when they're setting compensation. When setting compensation, there are all sorts of resources available. Uh, the goal of the presentation was to have a presenter from uh, a law firm, from an accounting firm, and from a actual valuation expert to sort of explain the process. Um, when we see the issue raised, when I see the issue raised, most often I see the issue raised uh, well after uh, the fact. Uh, it's always, as I said in the slide, too late. Um, the most recent times I've seen executive compensation, compensation issues raised were uh, during examination when the IRS raised this as a potential problem, uh, specifically with respect to 4958, which we'll discuss later, and the IRS has assessed penalties against an executive. But I've also seen it when the articles that I just mentioned come out where my client will call me up and say, hey, wait a second, why is this article complaining about my salary? Because I think I'm getting paid just enough. What's wrong with this? What do I say when uh, journalists or others start calling me up and, and asking why am I getting paid this much? How do I explain myself? Um, if that's when you're asking the question, the question's been asked too late. Um, if you set up a, a compensation process that really looks at how the compensation is approved and the amount that is approved, then when situations like that happen, first when the IRS comes out, you'll have your answers, you'll be set up, and you'll be ready to address any issues the IRS raise, uh, raises. But then also when uh, this article comes out and your, your chief executive or you yourself are mentioned in an article uh, and someone calls you up and says, why are you making this much money, you will have the comparability data, you will have uh, the information that the board considered in approving the compensation, and you'll have a, a, com a compelling answer as to why um, the compensation that you're paid is actually quite reasonable. Um, the other important part of that is, uh, as I sort of hinted at before, is that there are all sorts of resources available. Um, if you are going to your law firm or your, your legal counsel and saying, hey, legal counsel, tell me how much money I should be making, um, you will get an answer. Uh, I just can't tell you how good that answer is because I know myself I am not the best valuation expert because I don't have the training or the experience necessary to provide a good study. Uh, similarly, uh, I think Travis would tell you that, that if you go to Travis and say, provide me with what reasonable compensation is, he probably won't be give you the best answer either. Uh, Pete, the one who's missing today, would be the person to, do, to go to about that question. However, if you go to Pete and say, now that you've given me this, please advise me on the legal issues relating to the provision of the compensation in your report, whether I pay at the 25th percentile, whether I pay at the 75th percentile, or whether I think that my executive is so great we need to pay at the 90th percentile. Uh, please provide me with your legal opinion as to whether or not that's, all, that's acceptable. Pete can't do that. The important thing is that um, there's a variety of resources available, and each of the resources is an expert in a particular area. And the best thing I can advise 
clients and advise other organizations out there is to take advantage of all the resources, to take advantage of Pete, to take advantage of Travis, to take advantage of, of Venable and, and what we have to offer. And I should be remiss in, in not mentoring, mentioning also the, the importance of uh, compensation studies and surveys. And Matt's going to get into kind of some of the distinctions and differences between you know, an off-the-shelf compensation study or survey and, a, and kind of a tailored, focused, uh, for-hire uh, compensation study that's done for a particular organization. And there are uh, very uh, good and important reasons and differences uh, why, why some of those resources are, are more appropriate in some instances than in others. Uh, but our, our, our co-sponsor, for instance, Association Trends, uh, has a, both a national and a D.C. area um, nonprofit compensation uh, survey, kind of an off-the-shelf survey for various positions. That's a good example of a resource that can be very valuable to, to nonprofits in certain contexts. Uh, but Matt will get into more kind of the differences between those types of studies. In addition to uh, who to consult is when to consult. In, in the most appropriate time to consult a compensation expert or your legal uh, counsel with respect to the compensation you provided is prior to the provision of the compensation, prior to the board approval. Um, your legal counsel and the, the comp consultant and your tax advisors can all advise you on the ways that to best protect the organization when approving and providing such compensation. Uh, as I said, the, the Compliance issues with respect to executive compensation really sort of fall into to two categories. One are the exemption categories, and the second is intermediate sanctions. Uh, with the exemption categories, uh, the exemption issues that you receive with respect to uh, compensation are uh, private inurement and private benefit. With private inurement, um, the, the code section 501c3 and 501c4 organizations, as well as five, uh, I'm sorry, six, seven, and various others, are, require, are, are prohibited from allowing any portion of their assets or revenue to inert to the benefit of any individual or shareholder. Um, basically, if you are providing your executive with excessive compensation, then you are guilty of inurement. And the only uh, the only penalty for inurement is revocation of exempt status. So it's important to avoid inurement because uh, once, you, once your assets inure to the benefit of an insider, then revocation is... is and I should add that an insider uh, is, is any person who has, any person or company who has an ability to exercise substantial influence over the affairs of the organization. Uh, typically in this context, we're talking about, you know, perhaps C CEOs, CFOs, maybe CFOs, uh, but it can be others as well, and we've certainly encountered a number of instances where, you know, for instance, a former president who's now consulting to the organization and getting a very high, uh, you know, consulting package uh, dollar-wise from the organization could be considered an insider, and, and there are plenty of other examples as well. So, so be sure that while the focus today is, it, it often is on uh, um, a CEO, chief executive officer compensation, because those are the folks that typically earn the most from the organization and earn the greatest attention from the IRS and state attorneys general and the media and your adversaries and others, uh, it's, it's certainly not limited to that universe of folks. And J Jeff and Matthew, if I could just add to that as well, um, in referring to the definition of, of an insider or a disqualified person under the intermediate sanctions, we've seen in the, in the revised Form 990 in the instructions a new definition for who's called a key employee. We've always had to report officers and directors uh, and trustees, but now the 990 instructions talk about key employees and they actually almost paraphrase, it's not identical, but they talk about people with a certain responsibilities that are equivalent to officers, directors, and trustees, or also that have management or, or control over the organization um, and have that, quote, substantial influence, or really a 10% now per the 990 instructions. Yeah, and that's a great point, Travis. And, that, and it, it raises in, in very important process points, because if these folks are now going to be considered insiders or insiders for private enrollment purposes or disqualified persons for intermediate sanctions purposes, what that means is that all the advice that Matt's giving you about the types of, uh, you know, a preemptive uh, compensation benchmarking that you need to do and, 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 and uh, independent uh, bodies determining compensation before it's set, now what you would want to apply to those folks as well, which is something perhaps different than what you've done in the past in your organizations. So it really does open up a kind of a whole new world of a process and procedures that you may need and want to follow. Sorry to interrupt, Matt. 
No, no problem. The other, the other exemption issue is private benefit. Private benefit is not directly applicable to compensation provided to your chief officers. Uh, private benefit is a, is a sort of a, an expanded scope of private inurement. It includes uh, not just uh, disqualified persons, but pretty much anyone in the world. What we often see uh, private benefit raised with respect to executive compensation is uh, with regards to the family of certain executives. If you have an organization where um, the organization employs uh, not only the chief executive, but the chief executive's less accomplished younger brother, the chief executive's father who's on the verge of retirement, and grandfather who probably should be retired, the executive's wife and children, um, that's when we see situations where the IRS imposes private benefit based on the compensation provided not just to the executive but to all of the family of the executive because in those situations we'll say that really the, the per one of the purposes of the organization is simply to provide a compensation and a salary and a job to everyone that the executive uh, is, happens to be related to. Uh, private benefit is uh, something to note is that uh, anyone who's from a C6 or C7 organization out there, private benefit does not apply to those organizations, however, inurement does. But it, it certainly can apply. I know many, even 501c6 organizations that I see represented here in the room uh, have related 501c3 foundations, um, and the private uh, benefit doctrine certainly does apply to, to those organizations as well. Um, and, and it's just as an aside, it's a doctrine that the IRS seemed to have forgotten about for many years, uh, but as we can certainly attest through the, the, the many audits, the IRS audits that we've been through, the IRS has definitely rediscovered the private benefit doctrine and is actively enforcing it against 501c3 and four organizations. And like Matt said, it can apply to anyone, and it doesn't even have to be an insider, it doesn't even have to be an employee or even a family member of an employee. It can be any outside company that has a contract with the organization or even that doesn't but has uh, get some very significant benefit from some affiliation with your organization. Uh, it's a very kind of broad, wide-reaching uh, doctrine. And, and, and it, to simplify it, it's essentially a balancing test between public benefit and private benefit. And it's a very amorphous test. There's no black, black uh, lines to be drawn there. It's very difficult to tell. It, it, there's private benefit in so much of what a 501c3 organization does. The key is that the benefit cannot be impermissible. And how much is impermissible is, is a very difficult question to answer sometimes, but it's something that the IRS is, is very aggressively looking at these days. This brings us to intermediate sanctions. Intermediate sanctions is really why uh, executive compensation is relevant right now and is probably the most interesting area from my perspective regarding executive compensation and, and transactions with insiders. Um, Intermediate sanctions are provided under Code Section 4958, and basically what under 4958, the Internal Revenue Service is allowed to impose penalties on individuals with respect to executive compensation. Private endearment and private benefit generally are only applicable to uh, the organization. The exemption or revocation of exempt status is the only penalty under private benefit. It's the only penalty under private endearment. Uh, 4958 was enacted to allow the IRS to penalize individuals and not organizations. In theory, it's a great idea. Um, it's a situation where you have you know, one person who happens to have a, be in a position to assert authority over the activities of the organization, and that person decides to use their authority to enrich themselves. In those situations, the organization may be generally doing good activities, maybe an exempt organization, and there could just be one transaction that is problematic. And in those situations, it doesn't make sense to penalize an otherwise good organization for the activities of one bad actor. So intermediate sanctions was enacted to allow the IRS to penalize the bad actor uh, monetarily and allow the organization to continue to perform its exempt activities. Uh, these penalties are referred to as intermediate sanctions because they're intermediate penalties short of revocation. The, the penalties under 4958 are only imposed on disqualified persons, and the disqualified person is generally anyone who's in a position to exert control over the organization or the organization's activities. Uh, the, uh, the sort of spectrum of disqualified individuals include founders of the organization, executives of the organization, uh, substantial donors, um, uh, entities that are owned by founders or uh, 
founders or executives of the organization. So it's, it's really sort of a broad spectrum. But on the next slide, uh, sort of try to narrow it down to the most common terms. Uh, voting members of the board, officers such as the president, CFO, CEO, uh, treasurer, and uh, the organization's founders and some donors. The type of transactions that give rise to intermediate sanctions are as broad as the, the number of people who are subject to them. Uh, any transaction that provides compensation uh, to one of the dis disqualified persons is a transaction that can give rise to intermediate sanctions. Uh, whether that transaction is the purchase of property, the payment of uh, compensation for services, or even the reimbursement of certain benefits, there's a, if you provide compensation to an executive, that compensation needs to be reasonable. I want to bring your attention to the last point where I talk about uh, provision of certain fringe benefits and the re reimbursement of expenses as well. Uh, in those situations, there's something called uh, an automatic excess benefit, where a benefit is provided to an individual who's a disqualified person, and that benefit is not treated as compensation for purposes of the W-2, whether it's a reimbursement for uh, business travel or uh, whether it's just a, a fringe benefit that's just added on. If that's not treated as compensation, it is possible that the IRS can say that it's an automatic excess benefit where the person was received services for nothing. They're not going to treat it as compensation for services. They're going to say the organization received no services, and therefore the entire amount of that benefit is excessive. And this is something I've actually seen the IRS raise a couple times, and it's difficult to have any sort of defense against this. Uh, where I saw this was the reimbursement of uh, business travel expenses where the organization, uh, there was bad records and the organization didn't keep the receipts and the approval process for the reimbursement wasn't well documented. In those situations, the IRS asserted an excess benefit uh, uh, penalty of as low as $800 against one of the individuals um, and as high as $16,000 against others simply because they, the organization had bad records. Uh, and there's no defense because we couldn't provide the records that said, no, this truly was a business activity, this truly was a, a business conference, the hotel, the airfare, it was all reasonable and, and that's what they paid because they, the organization didn't keep the receipts. So it's important to not only when setting compensation but also in providing other benefits to keep track of those as well. Most times, uh, the question was, what would cause the IRS to look at this in the first place? We always see these, or I've always seen these, in examinations of the organization. And one of the parts of an examination of the organization is looking at compensation, looking at payments to uh, the executives. And where I've seen 4958 raised every time is in that context. The IRS comes and does an examination, says, uh, in most cases, you know, the organization's good, it's doing a good job. But there is this transaction, there are these transactions that give us a little bit of heartburn, and we're going to assess 458. Travis? Uh, uh, sure, Matt. I'm just going to add that the IRS has actually said that every audit that they do now of a tax exempt organization is going to include an executive compensation component. It may be large or small, depending on the facts of the organization, you know, what's disclosed in the 990, how people are paid. But that's, if they're going to do an audit of you, they're going to look at some level of detail executive comp. So that, that is primarily the, the the motive or the way the IRS would get into you. So now we've explained what 4958 is and what type of transaction it applies to. The question is why should you be concerned? And this is the big one here. The penalties under 4958 are really, uh, they're really harsh penalties. Um, first of all, uh, under 4958A, the IRS can impose a 25% excise tax on the entire amount of the excessive benefit received. Uh, in addition to that, the individual has to return the amount of the, ex the excessive amount of the benefit to the organization. So, uh, for simplicity, uh, you have an executive who's paid $200. The IRS says $100 is reasonable. The IRS will assess a 25% penalty on that $100, and then require the executive to return $100 to the organization. So essentially, the, your executive will be out $125 on a $200 uh, payment. If the individual does not return the benefit to the organization prior to the IRS assessing the tax, then you've got a bigger problem because under uh, 458B, 
the IRS can assess an additional 200% penalty on the amount of the excess benefit if not returned. So we're going back to our same situation where you have a $100 or $200 payment, the IRS says is worth 100. The IRS will then assess the $25 excise tax for the first part of it and then assess an additional $200 on top of that if not pay if not returned to the organization. Therefore, your executive will have been paid $200 and will have had paid the IRS $225 on that benefit. Uh, this is it's a really stiff penalty, and it becomes especially uh, difficult when you're dealing not with hundreds of dollars, but with thousands of dollars, or hundreds of thousands of dollars, or in some cases, millions of dollars. This is a revenue raiser for the IRS, and it's something that we've seen the IRS pursue very harshly. Uh, in addition to uh, the tax on the executive, um, sorry, the slide didn't go forward, but in addition to the tax on the executive themselves who receives it, there's a 10% tax on anyone who participates in the transaction. And participation can be, uh, uh, it can be anything from the individual actually receiving the benefit and, and selling it to the board members voting to approve the transaction themselves. So everyone who votes and says, I agree to give the $200 benefit to the individual will then have a 10% uh, excise tax or could be having a 10% excise tax based on their role in voting for it. Um, so the sort of summarize, why should you be concerned? Uh, the answer is simply because if you are an executive or a board member that receives a benefit from an organization, you need to be concerned because you can be taxed up to 225% of that benefit. Uh, if you are a board member who simply votes on it, you need to be concerned because you can be taxed on 10% of any excessive amount of the benefit. And if you are not an executive and you are not a board member, but you are an advisor or in some other capacity in working with the organization itself, you need to be concerned because if your chief executive is, has to pay $225 in tax on a $200 benefit, uh, as their advisor, you're going to be fired soon, or as their compliance officer, you're not going to have a job much longer. So this is something that's important for sort of everyone in the organization to really understand. Jeff? And as, um, you know, as that universe of, of insiders continue and dis or here disqualified persons continues to expand, now if, when we're not looking just at the chief staff executive but looking at other top executives where it typically is the chief staff executive who is the one who's setting the compensation for those folks, even if he or she uses uh, the three steps of the rebuttable presumption that Matt's going to talk about shortly, um, if it's deemed still that that uh, uh, compensation is excessive, then that chief executive officer who set the compensation for the other senior staff can also be hit with that 10% penalty. So we've talked about why you should be concerned, but now we've got to talk about why you should be concerned right now. And this is something, this is why we thought that this was an important presentation to do. The reason you need to be concerned right now is because right now the IRS has become aware of 4958 again. 4958 was enacted in, I think, 96. And initially the IRS had this new tool and they were trying to use it and they were trying to figure it out and they were trying to enforce this the new section of the code. Um, in 2000 and for 2005, the IRS lost a case uh, in the, the uh, Fifth Circuit uh, Court of Appeals. And in that case, the IRS didn't just lose, they got spanked pretty badly and the 30-page uh, opinion is pretty much uh, a complaint about how horrible a job the IRS did. And with that bad precedent and that horrible opinion for the IRS, uh, the IRS shied away from 4958. And in the next five, six years, the IRS really didn't impose 4958 at all. They were very afraid of it. They didn't know what to do. However, in the last 18 months, we've seen more 4958 cases uh, raised than the previous six years combined. Um, and not only are we seeing the IRS raise this issue, but we're seeing the IRS raise it aggressively. And that's what is uh, one of the bigger concerns that I have. Uh, it's one thing when the IRS imposes something, but when the IRS is looking at this issue, they're not looking at it, I think, from, a, from a, the proper perspective. Uh, I had a client not too long ago who the IRS asserted 4958 against, and this was a client in uh, uh, Los Angeles, which is a large city in an expensive part of the country, and they were the, uh, the two highest officers of the organization. 
would the IRS put together the comparability study to determine what appropriate compensation would be, the IRS compared these two individual salary in L.A. to um, Dubuque, Iowa, um, uh, Morning Springs, Indiana, um, and in several other parts of the country. The largest city they did one, uh, one executive they compared to was in Dallas. One con executive was in uh, Providence, Rhode Island. But aside from that, every other city they compared to were cities of populations of less than 50,000 uh, people. Uh, so the IRS isn't necessarily, uh, when they're going after this issue, they're not necessarily going after with a very conservative amount saying, well, we're not exactly sure what reasonable, but we know reasonable is no greater than this. They're actually going out with a very aggressive amount and saying, this is what reasonable is, and you're going to have to fight us to prove otherwise. So this is something that you really need to be concerned about. Uh, in addition to the IRS sort of becoming aware of this and aggressively pursuing this, this is something that the IRS has published information about. In the 2011 uh, work plan for the Tax Exempt and Government Entities Division, the IRS specifically said that one of the issues that's going to be a focus of theirs, both from a regulation and an enforcement perspective, is executive compensation and intermediate sanctions. Uh, this is something that the IRS is aware of and something they're going after. Uh, also, in the interim report for the College and University Compliance Project, which was published uh, in March of 2009, the IRS specifically said and specifically looked at intermediate sanctions and executive compensation, including uh, uh, board approval for the executive compensation, the, the governments regarding uh, who approves compensation, uh, a wide variety of issues. What's important to know about that is that when the IRS sets up a uh, guidance with respect to examinations, they then train all of the agents that are working on these cases across the country to look for these issues. Therefore, even when the, no the issue is no longer a hot issue for the IRS, every agent that will be doing an examination in the future is doing the examination after having just been trained to find 4958. And one of the things you see is that when someone's trained to find something, they find it even when they're told that's not their primary purpose. So this is something that's going to be an issue for years to come. And finally, um, not only are they, is IRS pursuing this in a compliance and the examination level, but based on recent conversations with individuals in counsel's office, uh, we've been told that there's a green light to litigate. And to that end, we're actually in litigation right now on a 4958 case where the IRS has taken what I believe to be an unreasonable position. And the IRS is going to fight that position all the way to court. So um, not only are the penalties bad, but even if you win the case, you could spend thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars winning the case because the IRS is litigating. The question, the question was, with respect to the college and university compliance project, how are athletic coaches uh, being reported and, and what's the IRS's position on that? First of all, I can assure you, with respect to any university that could possibly be a uh, client of anyone on this panel, the compensation is definitely reasonable. <laughs> uh, but uh, more specifically, Ed, Travis may be in a better position to, to discuss more thoroughly than I will because he's actually worked on several uh, audits of, of the under the compliance project. But one of the ways that, that schools are able to offer such high salaries to coaches and uh, avoid the scrutiny of exempt status is because a lot of the, a good portion of the salary is paid by third parties, uh, an alumni association, a friend of the program, um, or uh, the compensation is paid as a uh, part of the coach's weekly TV show or radio show. Um, so the compensation comes not necessarily 100% from the organization, but Travis can go further. Uh, oh, sure, Matt, thanks. And, and the question's a, a great one. And that's exactly right. I mean, the, the, the IRS on the examinations that they're currently doing uh, across the country at a variety of schools as part of their uh, compliance check for, for colleges and universities, executive compensation hits 
is one of the key things that they're doing. And then more, uh, in more detail, they're looking at the highest paid individuals. So an athletic coach may not be one of these quote unquote disqualified persons. Um, you'd have to go through the analysis whether they, they hit that uh, disqualified persons for the intermediate sanctions. But nonetheless, the IRS is looking at the compensation paid to the six highest individuals or sometimes even more depending upon the, the compensation and the, and that's paid. Uh, and, the, and, and, the, and the actual type of, type of organization. But they are looking at not only what's paid on, and reported on the W-2, they're looking at what's paid by an affiliated foundation, uh, alumni association, or a booster club, as, as Matt mentioned, and then by also third parties, too. It may be someone that's uh, you know, out in the, the corporate sponsor that's, that's contributing to the athletic program at the school is also compensating the coach indirectly. So the IRS is looking at all of those issues. Um, in great detail. How would the IRS get that information? Like an athletic coach who's getting paid by the local TV station, getting paid by Nike, that wouldn't, that wouldn't be funneled to the university, would it? Sure. To, I guess to repeat the question is, is how did the IRS find out information about third-party payments? Um, you know, the local TV station or, or a, uh, you know, an apparel uh, company. Uh, and there's many times it actually is sometimes spelled out in the employment contract, and I actually am going to show a slide later where the IRS does ask for employment contracts or other side agreements where they have the ability to get that on examination. Um, certainly, if it's not known to, to the organization, to the university or college, then the, you know, the college has no way of, of communicating that to the IRS. But if it's spelled out in one of the agreements, which it often is, then that's the way the IRS really finds out about it and can make uh, additional inquiries. Uh, the IRS is looking. The question is: Does it matter whether the university is public or private? Um, it, it it might uh, on the intermediate sanction side, but uh, from the IRS's examination, uh, they're they're examining both public and private schools. Yeah, and I should say that, and we've seen it firsthand many times that the IRS has kind of broad third-party subpoena authority in connection with audits. So they will frequently issue subpoenas to you know, random third parties that are connected to or making payments to individuals that are employed by the the uh, institutions and whatnot. Well, hopefully, I've convinced you that you need to be concerned about intermediate sanctions, and hopefully, I've convinced you that it is now a timely time to be concerned about it. Let's talk about how you protect yourselves and your organizations. Uh, first of all, just generally speaking, uh, be prudent. Uh, if you have used caution when entering into transactions, when you use that sort of first gut check where this seems high, we should look into this, that is always your first line of defense. It's, it's good to be prudent and cautious when doing these things. Uh, if you develop and follow a strong conflict of interest policy, a, a, a strong uh, compensation approval policy, then you're going to be ensured that that the organization is setting its compensation using a sort of uh, a, a formulaic approach that is done hopefully to avoid providing excessive compensation. And then all the people who are actually approving the compensation are independent and in doing so from the perspective of is this agreement best for the organization. And then once again, just Follow, uh, require board approval for entering into certain tra transactions or certain types of payments. Uh, more specifically, the regulations under 4958 provide for uh, a rebuttable presumption of reasonableness. The rebuttable presumption of reasonableness is, creates a presumption that when a transaction is approved in a certain way using certain information, that the amount of the transaction is reasonable. Now, uh, in the title, it is rebuttable. Uh, so the IRS can rebut the, 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 the assumption, that the presumption that it's reasonableness, but it is sort of a first line of defense, and it raises the, um, the bar a little bit higher for the IRS. The IRS can't just say, I think this is an excessive transaction. They've got to go out and find documentation to show it's excessive. And not only that, because uh, you'll have documentation showing it's reasonable, they've got to get good uh, good uh, documentation. Uh, the report I told you before where they were comparing the LA organization to Dubuque organizations or uh, organizations in, in Indiana, uh, that wouldn't fly because you would have a report or some sort of analysis comparing the LA organization to organizations in similar cities doing similar activities, uh, LA, Chicago, New York, uh, something like that. And so the, the IRS would have to get a similar study. And while they could still reach the conclusion that the organization provided excessive compensation, that 
conclusion would take them a lot more work to do. And uh, not to disparage uh, the Internal Revenue Service, but one of the things I found on examination is that the more work you make an agent do, the less likely the agent is to do the work and the more likely the agent will be to take the uh, position presented. So uh, it's always something good from that perspective. The rebuttal presumption of reasonableness requires an organization prior to the approval of a transaction, um, it requires the governing body to compare the value of the consideration provided to what is reasonable across the board. From this situation, compensation. You would look at the similar title, similar organization, um, uh, similar location. You'd look at those organizations and you would say the CEO of the organization that is closest to us gets paid X amount. Uh, the CEO of the, the 10 organizations that are closest to us you pay an average of, of Y amount. And basing the compensation on that, you have to then decided that this is who we are comparable to, this is what we are like, and this is what like organizations. These are the people who, who are competing with to hire our executive. Um, the, uh, and I said to present to the board, the first step is that the disinterested members of the board must approve it. So. Uh, the executive, even if the executive is on the board of directors, shouldn't participate in the discussion or the vote of their own compensation. Uh, after uh, approving the compensation, after reviewing the comparability data, the board needs to note in its minutes what uh, the amount that it approved and sort of its reasons for approving it. And once you do that, you, you have disinterested members of the board who looked at comparability data, who documented their decision, after that happens, you have established the presumption that the compensation provided is reasonable. And this works for a variety of transactions, not just for compensation. It works for uh, lease agreements with buildings owned by uh, related entities or owned by, uh, directly by your executive. It works with uh, the purchase of property. It also works with um, certain donations where there will be a benefit provided to the donor in exchange for the donation. So this is something that you should take part and uh, consider and use in your board minutes in any transaction that provides compensation to an insider. And, and even for, for non-501c3 organizations like 501c6 trade and professional associations, uh, there's now a question, as you know, on the, on the IRS Form 990 that essentially asks whether you're following these steps in setting executive compensation. So if you want to be able to check yes to that box, you need to be able to follow you need to be able to follow these steps, and it's highly advisable to follow them, um, even uh, for organizations that are not subject to intermediate sanctions like C6 organizations, uh, because it does uh, carry a lot of weight in the event of an IRS examination. Uh, that concludes kind of Matt's uh, prepared remarks. And by the way, I forgot to mention at the outset in introducing Matt that Matt is a, is a veteran of the IRS Chief Counsel's Office, so he also speaks from, uh, from kind of the insider's experience as well. But now he's going to put on kind of a third hat and, uh, and pretend that he's Pete Smith and, and walk through a few highlights of, of Pete's presentations. Uh, Pete is a, a very experienced uh, compensation consultant who does a lot of um, compensation studies uh, specifically for, for nonprofit organizations, uh, and it's also seen uh, how, as has Matt and, and as has Travis, how these compensation studies stack up uh, under IRS scrutiny. And I think hopefully one of the things you're going to take away from, from today's discussion is that simply relying on a pre-published compensation study, simply going out and hiring a compensation consultant to do a study for you, uh, they're not all equal. Uh, and the IRS is very much dissecting and challenging compensation studies these days. Um, so how you go about it, it's, it's something that I think a lot of folks don't, don't fully grasp. Uh, but the, the, there's a lot more to a meaningful, defensible compensation study um, that's going to hold up under scrutiny uh, you know, with respect to the rebuttable, rebuttable presumption or otherwise. Uh, so, so pay attention to this presentation. I think you'll walk away with some valuable tips. Uh, with respect to, to Pete's portion of the presentation, I've seen Pete give this presentation before. Uh, Pete is very, very good, uh, an interesting speaker, and has a lot of useful information. So for my benefit, I would hope that you would pretend that I was good and interesting, uh, just to make it more real like Pete's here. Um, Looking at sort of what the IRS looks at, what is reasonable, the, the first of all, as I said before, it, the, it needs to be a comparable organization. I'm not seeing the IRS do this when they're saying what should be taxed, but 
when looking at a comparable organization, you should compare your organization to uh, organizations that are comparable in size, and comparable in their activities, and comparable in their geography. As, as we sort of talked about before, LA is not Dubuque, and Dubuque is not New York. So you can't compare those to each other. Uh, also, if you are an organization with four employees, you should not and cannot compare yourself to an organization with 4,000 employees. Um, and finally, mission is also something that's also very unique to organizations. Uh, an organization that is simply um, a, a private foundation or, or merely a, a not necessarily conducting significant activities can't be compared to a large hospital group. Um, you also look at some of the things that make the organization unique and the executive unique, such as the executive's experience and credentials. Uh, we were talking earlier to, an, uh, before the presentation, I was talking to an organization whose executives are all medical doctors. Well, the, the medical doctor's experience and their uh, credentials and their salary uh, and their ability to achieve a higher salary outside of this organization are all greater, and that needs to be considered when setting this uh, organization's compensation. Um, so uh, these are all things that you look at. And another thing to look at is the individual's tenure. Is this a, an individual that has uh, served on the, as an executive of the organization for the last 10 years when the organization has experienced unprecedented growth? If so, that's something that needs to be considered. If this, if this executive took you from a small a small one city organization for, with four employees to an international organization with 4,000 employees, that's something that needs to be considered and something that makes the executive more valuable to the organization and therefore the compensation could be higher. Uh, some of the sources of information uh, Pete has listed here, as I said, any, anyone in this room or any executive in, in, that's listening to this, if they were to send me their name and organization, I could tell you the executive within five minutes because I would look at the first one and look at GuideStar and see what was reported on the 990. All this stuff is, is available. There's better resources than others. There's more recent information than others. And this is something that Travis is going to talk about a little bit in his presentation. Um, Pete has some numbers here. I'm not exactly sure what they're for, but I'm going to do my best. Uh, this looks like a tax compensation provided by certain Texas nonprofits, and it provides with certain criteria across the board. They're all in Texas, so the location is, is somewhat similar. But with respect to uh, size and their expenses, their employees, and their executive compensation, if we're just looking at compensation, um, there's uh, one organization that's 150% of everyone else and, and one that's 145, and they both have small employees. So if we were just looking at the number of employees, it would seem that the 145 and 150% organizations are a bit high. I think those are uh, E and F. Um, as we look, we see that they're all very different types of organizations on the next slide, um, where the 145% organization is, is highlighted as uh, being an opera organization. Um, on the, the next slide, we see that, that this was compared to other opera organizations, where the, while the individual, the CEO, would be paid 145% of the median for Texas organizations, they're actually per, per, uh, paid less than the median for opera organizations across the organization. So you're, you're looking at different things here. Not only are you looking at uh, salary and size of the organization and location of the organization, but you've also got to compare it to the type of organization that it is. So if there's anything we've learned here, I think that um, it's better to be an executive of an opera organization than a regular organization uh, by hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, I know what my next job is going to be. and. Uh, the other thing is that you've got to compare across several different factors, not just location, not just size. Um, looking at the Form 990 only, there are several issues with it. Uh, stale data, something that Travis is going to talk about a bit. Uh, regional differences, uh, because you're looking at 990s, you're pulling 990s from across the country, you've got to, you've got to tame that and bring it in. Uh, you're also looking at situations where there are changes in management that are, you don't know when they take place because uh, the 990 you report the compensation received in a year, but you don't know if the executive worked for nine months that year, worked for two months that year, uh, or worked for a week that year as an interim position. Um, so when targeting uh, pay levels, 
what is reasonable? And that depends on the organization, on the individual. There are some organizations where 25% is what they want to pay. There are some organizations that are our clients that tell us we want to pay at the 90th percentile. We want to be really a, 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 we want to set the market here be, for these reasons. Um, some of the things that, that Pete had mentioned in a prior uh, presentation was uh, one of the things he discussed was internal equity. If your organization pays everyone in the organization uh, somewhere in the 20, 25th percentile, and then pays your executive at the 95th percentile, that is something that the IRS is going to latch on to when, they're, when they come out, say, why, why is this person 90th percentile material and everyone else is, is paid so cheaply? But it's also something that's going to cause a great deal of resentment in the organization, as we discussed in the beginning. Um, another thing is the consideration of competitiveness of benefits. If the cash compensation is right at the 50th percentile, it may look good, but when the IRS comes out, they see that in addition to the cash compensation, um, the, all of the executive's health care is paid for, the executive has a private jet, and the executive has three cars at their disposal. Well, the IRS is likely to assert 4958 anyways because those additional benefits would so greatly exceed what is, what is competitive out there. Um, this is, goes more into uh, equity, it looks like. Uh, which we talked about, so I'll skip through there. Um, and then the, he talks about the optics of compensation. Um, one of the things he likes to talk about is what the public think would review this as. Um, every everyone who who looks at a compensation report says, uh, especially if they're getting paid less than the executive who's who's getting the compensation, says, "Well, I would do that job for that much." Personally, I'd sit through an opera for $400,000. Uh, I would have no problem doing that. And because I don't understand the complexities of the, the executive's position and because I don't understand everything that the executive does on a daily basis or the, the unique perspective that's required, I don't understand that I'm not qualified to do that. I actually understand I'm not qualified to run an opera. But the IRS agent that's out there that's getting paid twenty five or $27,000 may not understand that he or she is not qualified to run an opera. They may understand that they are qualified to cash a check that pays them $400,000 a year, but they don't understand the intricacies of the, the organization itself or the, the experience that's required. Maybe the organization only hires people that had experience either performing in or playing in or building sets for operas. Uh, I don't know, and these are all things that, that that it's important to consider when, when providing compensation is that the, everyone who gets paid less than the $450,000 that the opera executive makes is going to say, I could do that job and I would do it for less. I would do it for $410,000 and it'd be a great deal for the organization. So these are th the things that you need to keep in mind. Um, and here Pete says the same thing. Uh, most people believe that executives should be paid less. Uh, when I talked to individuals at the IRS, when I was at the IRS, I would hear all the time, these people are, are taking jobs for charities or C3s because they're committed to what the organization does, not because they want a salary. So the perception is, especially with the IRS, is that the, you should be paid less because you get the benefit of working for a cause that makes you happy as opposed to the, the regular corporate grind. So just some things to consider. Uh, moving on to Travis. Sure, thanks so much, Matt. And I know that I can't sing inside the shower or outside the shower. So I'm gonna stick with the accounting profession and not jump to the opera uh, compensation aside. But uh, I am going to uh, talk about three primary issues and then I think we're going to have some time left at, uh, at the end of my presentation for some questions that I, maybe uh, you all have in the audience here that Jeff's accumulated from, from you or that are on the phone. Um, I'm going to mention a little bit more uh, in detail on the Form 990 in particular, what's uh, required for reporting um, and some best practices. I'm not going to go into a great amount of detail because the instructions are, are just that very detailed. Um, and then I am going to tell a little bit of maybe a couple of war stories from some of the IRS examinations that I've seen recently that are underway and what the, the IRS is looking at 
Um, we've already mentioned the college and university compliance project that's underway. And then uh, Jeff and Matt asked me to, to put my auditor hat on. I'm a CPA by background, but I'm a tax accountant, so I'm not an auditor. Um, but uh, PwC does a number of audits, um, uh, possibly for some of you uh, out there in the audience. Uh, and so they asked me to speak to FIN48, or which is now uh, codified uh, as ASC740, Accounting for Uncertainty in Income Taxes, and how this idea of executive compensation, and more in particular, intermediate sanctions and private and private benefit could have some impact there, negative impact perhaps. Um, so first off, I've got a couple of slides uh, here that go into a little bit more detail about the Form 990. And, and I will mention, um, if, you're, you, if you have a book and you're in the room or if you're moving through the slide deck on, on the phone on the webinar, at the very end, and, and I'll push to the slides maybe later at the end, I put in a snapshot uh, of the, the actual form uh, itself, Part 7, which is the Form 990 for compensation, and the Schedule J, which is the detailed schedule uh, if you're required to file it based on, on certain compensation thresholds. And um, maybe a plug for us at PwC, we put together a, a, a comprehensive set of this, uh, the entire form and all 16 schedules. And, and this year, um, you know, the IRS redesigned the Form 990 uh, in 2008 with the, the tax year 2008 version of the form. Uh, this year they've made some tweaks and changes into the instructions and the forms themselves for 2010. Uh, and we annotated them in, in yellow and, and I've put here in the, in the slide deck again the pages specific to compensation. But if anyone's interested in the full bound set uh, of annotated uh, instructions and forms, I'm certainly happy to send those to you. You can email me. Um, and we can send you a PDF with all of that information that's searchable. Um, on my slide in front of you, uh, just a reminder that the Form 990 is for large organizations, and that threshold's come down uh, for 2010. You're required to file it if you have uh, greater than $200,000, uh, excuse me, uh, 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 $200,000 of, of gross receipts or $500,000 of total assets as at the end of the year. If you're a smaller organization, smaller than those two thresholds, you could qualify for the 990EZ, which is basically unchanged for a number of years, and, and the compensation that's required to be disclosed thereon is, is uh, less uh, significant um, and less burdensome. And then if you're a very small organization with uh, gross receipts of uh, greater than or equal to $50,000, you have to file one of the 990 postcards or 990Ns that has no compensation on it, but I, I would assume that everyone in the room is probably a 990 filer, uh, possibly a 990EZ filer. And just a few comments before I move on, and it, again, it kind of springboards off what Matt and, and Jeff said. You know, the 990 is really your SEC equivalent for a, for a public registrant, your window onto the world. You know, everyone uh, from a public company perspective has to file with the SEC and include executive compensation. And, and for a tax-exempt organization that has to file the 990, that's really what it's become because it now has questions of governance and, and how your organizations govern. It has questions about how compensation is set. And then for certain individuals, it has the compensation numbers, as Matt said. We could find it within probably less than 10 minutes uh, for your organization. So it's really a window onto your world and it's used by so many different people. I mean, you file it with the IRS. Of course, they use it, and we've talked about examinations. But state regulators have significantly increased their oversight responsibility, um, not just in the departments of revenue or departments of taxation, but you know, from, from other areas you know, like state charity regulators or attorneys general. Um, and, and as well, of course, um, Capitol Hill's uh, obviously focused in on, on exempt organizations and nonprofits, and as well as donors and media. Matt's already mentioned many of those. So I, I think reporting the information has to be taken seriously. So a, a couple of considerations um, about executive compensation, and these are certainly not an exhaustive list on my slide here in front of us, but these are things that as we prepare tax returns or we review tax returns for your organizations, this is what we see as sort of stumbling blocks. Um, first off, I mentioned in the new form, you're required now to report your compensation based on the calendar year that ends within your fiscal year. So if you're a calendar year end organization with the 1231 year end, then you report, you know, for, for 2011, you report based on 2011 calendar data. But it, for many of you, you may be fiscal year end organizations. I personally have a, a practice that has a lot of June 30 year ends, 
a lot of August 31 year ends and September 30 year ends. And that information, I think Matt mentioned during Pete's slide, uh, becomes stale because you're reporting, if you're a September 30 year end, 2011, you're reporting compensation data based on the calendar year end 2010 because that was the calendar year that ended within your fiscal year. And then if you extend your 990 out to the last possible date, you may not file that 990 until August of the following calendar year. So that 990 data and the compensation therein uh, becomes quite stale. And maybe that works to your advantage. A lot of times I have to remind my clients that they're really reporting on historic data that goes back a number of months. Um, and it also ties now to the W-2 for box five, or if, if you are compensated on a 1099 as an independent contractor, uh, possibly for, for a trustee or a director on box seven. So you can tie cash compensation back to, to something tangible on a tax return that you already file with the government. Um, navigating the different compensation thresholds, I'm not going to go into all of them, but suffice it to say that, that depending upon the type of individual that you're reporting, an officer or a trustee, uh, or if it's a key employee, the key employee, for example, has to be paid over $150,000 in order to be required to re be reported on the 990. Or for highly compensated employees, that's $100,000. So, you know, again, you have to really go out to the 990 instructions, and the devil becomes in the details on whether or not uh, you have to actually report someone. Uh, another uh, mention, too, while I'm thinking about it, the IRS you know, redesigned the Form 990 for 2008's version. And during that process, they asked for public comment and everyone, every association, uh, every constituent, whether it's the ABA, ASCPA, PwC, other accounting firms and law firms submitted comments. Well, two years went by and lo and behold, the IRS has now asked for public comments again. They were actually due August 1st, and I'm looking at PwC's letter, uh, and we dated it August 1st. Uh, just in time. Uh, but even though we're past the first, I'm sure IRS would still take your comments. Uh, I know that I've seen the AICPA. I'm not sure if, if Jeff or Matt know if the ABA is commenting, but they asked for, for uh, responses to certain questions that, uh, that they asked. One being, are all the compensation thresholds that are, that are in the 990 instructions and required to be reported on the return, are they all make sense? And, and our response to PwC was, you probably ought to, to continue those compensation thresholds at the amounts that they're currently at, um, even though they are sometimes uh, a little bit confusing. Uh, I also mentioned about uh, what constitutes a related organization, and I think we talked about this in the earlier Q&A, that oftentimes your members of senior management may be paid by a related organization. Maybe they're paid by a foundation. Um, and if they're related in, in accordance with the IRS definition, you're required to report that comp on your return in a different column, but the full picture, the full compensation package is going to get disclosed. So if it's paid by a related entity, you're not going to avoid disclosure on the 990, at least you're not supposed to. Uh, and then the last bullet I have here is about management companies. That also was a query from the IRS in this past comment period. Uh, if you employ a management company, that's a little tricky because uh, you're required to report the compensation as if paid uh, directly by the organization for the top management official, the CEO, for example, or the top financial officer, like a chief financial officer, um, as if paid directly. But if you pay people through management companies otherwise, it may not go on the, on the compensation schedule, but you may have to report it as a highly paid independent contractor, or you may also have to report the transaction later on Schedule L, which is transactions with interested persons. So be mindful of, of management companies. One other thing I, I talked about, I think, uh, when Matt was speaking was the definition of key employees. That definition's changed. So now you have a $150,000 threshold for a key employee, but you also have a new test, a new in, in three years ago, excuse me, so I guess it's not new anymore, but it's a test that's uh, basically a, a responsibility test, whether someone acts like an officer um, but doesn't have that uh, that title, or someone that manages a, a significant segment, 10% or more of the organization, or has control over things like the budget or capital expenditures of the organization, um, uh, they would be defined as a key employee. 
I think we've moved on to the next slide now. Um, I wanted to, to, to look a little bit more detailed at Schedule J. Um, in the 990, you've got a lot of information around governance. Uh, we talked earlier about that rebuttable presumption standard. There's a question in there about whether or not you avail yourselves of the rebuttable presumption standard for your uh, CEO and other members of management, and you're required to make that disclosure. Um, but on Schedule J, for certain individuals that are, that are paid um, and hit that threshold, and, and again, I think for probably most of you in the audience, you're filing Schedule J, you're required to, to disclose questions about fringe benefits and perks, you are also required to describe those on, on the Schedule J in written disclosure. Uh, you are required to describe how compensation is set, whether or not you use a compensation consultant like a Pete Smith, whether you look at other 990s on GuideStar, um, whether you have a compensation committee that, that reviews and approves of it. Um, severance. This comes as a great shock to many organizations that haven't had turnover at the senior level. Um, in recent years, but now you're required to check a box if you paid severance or you had another change of control payment. And more importantly, you're required to name the individual and provide the amount. So if you think about uh, someone that has an employment agreement or a severance arrangement that's been in place for a number of years and for whatever reason they've left and the severance gets triggered, it will come as a great surprise that that's going to be on the 990 and probably an un uh, you know, not a, a pleasant one. Uh, but it is required disclosure. And I've had conversations with, with some of my uh, uh, attorney counterparts as well, um, like Matt and Jeff. Uh, you know, there's sometimes provisions that are in a severance agreement, even though it's to be maintained in a confidential nature. If you're required to disclose it as a matter of law, uh, then, then you can do that, and, and sometimes that does happen. Uh, also, non-qualified deferred compensation. There's a question about uh, non-qualified retirement plans. That's specifically uh, what's called a 457F plan or other types of non-qualified deferred compensation amounts that are promised today and to be paid in the future, whether or not they're taxable or not, you're required to disclose that and provide the amount. And other special pay plans, I've listed down here things like equity pay plans, uh, pay that's based on the, the revenue of the organization gross or net earnings, and some of those, again, come back into those private inurement uh, type considerations. There's other, other things to go through, but I kind of want to move on now uh, pretty quickly and get through public inspection requirements. We've already said, and I'm going to skip this slide, I think, for purposes of time, that the 990 is required to be disclosed. And you're required to disclose three years of the 990, the date after it's filed, and you can't redact compensation. That's not, not permitted, so it's going to be out there. So some things to consider now. I, I say that the numbers don't tell the whole story, and we've already discussed how things are to be described in, in words uh, and that you you're tell the story beyond just the numbers. So I see disclosure from my clients as sort of a continuum. Uh, of course, you have to make the minimum amount required by the form and required by the instructions and the regulations that, that underlie them. Uh, but I believe that it's probably best to tell a bigger story, especially if you have certain pay plans that need some better descriptions. You may be required at a minimum to provide the amount, but maybe you want to tell a little bit more about why you're providing that amount uh, because of tenure for the executive, for example, we've mentioned that, or, or special credentials that might pers that person may have. Okay, uh, and then also about the process. Um, same as last year is not going to work because people change, um, pay changes, uh, and, and you can't really just continue what you've done in the past. Also, gathering the information, start early, because I, I mentioned that you tie everything back to W-2 uh, from, a, from a cash compensation perspective, but you've already got benefits that may need to be reported, and you've got deferred compensation. So that's going to be the hard pieces. So you have to look at things like employment agreements or side letters. And then also, I think you need to understand who controls the process. Um, by control, I mean, is there a project manager? Oftentimes that's in the finance shop, oftentimes that's in, in the, the legal side of the house. Maybe you have a special tax director. Maybe you turn it over to your accountant uh, to prepare the return, and are they the project manager? Um, and and you know, consider, of course, using outside law firms, compensation consultants, and, and accountants. And then I think it's really critical to understand the review process and make sure you have a review process, because you now have to describe it in the 990. Um, and that includes probably review at the board level to some extent, 
um, maybe a committee of the board like the comp committee or the finance or audit committee. But I also think it's important, and I didn't write it on the slide, but it's out of common courtesy that you probably want to in inform the individuals that are going to have their comp reported um, what that amount is, and then, of course, the written descriptions that underlie it if you're required to make that description. And I think it's also just a good check for accuracy. You know, so you know, you're putting this return out here to the public, make sure that they have uh, buy-off on it as well. Now, I'm not going to read I, on the next slide. I can make a change. Apologize for that. Um, I'm not going to read all of these and certainly encourage you to read this slide and the next slide later, but these are real-life questions that the IRS has asked on examinations recently. All of these came out of a college and university compliance project and the audits that are underway. They did uh, compliance checks a number of years ago. Matt mentioned the interim report that they published. Now they're examining a, a, a number of schools and, and these are standard boilerplate questions. These aren't from one institution, but these are questions that the IRS is asking at every school. And if you look at this slide here, you can see these are all focused on setting compensation. It's all about the process and the independent nature of the compensation committee and how it's chosen, whether or not they're family or business relationships. I think we've uh, <laughs> had a uh, possible earthquake. Sorry, for those of you on the uh, phone, we have a Pretty violently shaking building here in DC. Apparently Travis is so good the earth moves. <laughs> Maybe the IRS didn't like what I had to say or what Matt had to say and they've but all joking aside we may want to figure out what happened. <laughs> terminate the presentation. There is an earthquake here in D.C. Thank you very much for your participation.